Hello. Hello, everybody. Uh, I've been asked to be very punctual, so it's 12.15, and I'm going to start with this talk about how ICIJ cracked the biggest leaks in journalism history. We are here in a movie theater, so what a better way to start than playing a trailer. So, Juanjo, please, play my trailer. This is just a small trailer of what I'm going to talk about. I'm going to talk about today about this, about all the leaks that we've been receiving in the company I worked for, the International Consortium of Investigative Journalists. And they have all been connected to offshore finance, which is basically a parallel system to the economy that we know, a parallel system being used by the rich and the powerful for purposes like evading taxes. I don't know if you were in the keynote today from the representative of the Agencia Tributaria, Spanish tax agency. He said he was not going to talk about how to not to pay taxes. I am going to talk about how the rich and the powerful in our societies don't pay taxes, how they hide and how they, we expose them thanks to the leaks that we've been receiving in the past years. We've been doing leak based investigations on the offshore world for the past several years. And I'm going to talk about Panama Papers and the Paradise Papers, which I hope you have all listened um, about. Uh, we just published the Paradise Papers a week ago. And it's the sixth investigation that we have done on this topic. But before doing that, I really want to talk to you about journalism for a bit, because I imagine many of you come from technical backgrounds. I don't know if there are any journalists in the room. Well, one journalist. Um, so let me bring you into my reality. Let me bring you into my world. This is how newsrooms look like. Um, this is a photo of a newsroom in Florida. A lot of paper, right? This is another newsroom in Japan. Same pattern. Some journalists are organized, though, like this colleague in Argentina. But even if he's organized, the pattern repeats itself. Journalists are surrounded by paper. Who isn't today? Well, I'm sure you probably will tell me, yeah, but we have a lot of electronic documents. We're in a big data conference. Sure. But many times, we get all these documents in my profession. We put them in our computers, in backup drives. And then we forget about them. This is trying, it's starting to change with big data and technology. We're trying to apply all these techniques that you guys are talking about here to our profession too. But we are very slow. So I want you to be patient because I'm going to be talking about things that are probably very basic uh, for you and sound like, you know, what you guys did 10 years ago. Well, this is cutting edge in journalism today. And thanks to that, we've made prime ministers resign, like the prime minister of Iceland, the prime minister of Pakistan. We've made governments around the world to open up investigations. Just in one of our latest investigations, we accounted for 150 investigations open in 79 countries. So the technology that I'm going to talk about today probably will look rudimentary to you but it's having a great impact around the world. Let me see if, oops, sorry, I'm not seeing it here. Um, anyway, but before, before I talk about that, um, what I want to tell you is how do we normally in journalism receive documents, right? And for that, I need to step back and give a jump into history. And I'm going to show you this document. This is the front page of one of the biggest, uh, most famous leaks in journalism history back in the late uh, 60s. Ah, gracias. Now I see the, the slides. Um, this is the Pentagon Papers. Maybe you guys uh, know about it. It was a 7,000-page report 
um, that was leaked from inside the US government about the Vietnam War. And the leaker, the whistleblower, had to make photocopies of this report before handing it to the journalists. A bit later, who hasn't seen all the president's men? Maybe you haven't, now you have. Um, and you probably have seen this movie, All the President's Men, the Watergate scandal in the 70s, two reporters meeting with a source, Deep Throat, in a parking garage to preserve his anonymity. They needed to meet physically, in person, to get the information from him, from him to preserve his anonymity. That is not needed anymore. The biggest leak in journalism history started with a message without ever meeting that source in person. And that's what I'm gonna talk about today, the Panama Papers. These leaks are not just affecting my profession. These are some headlines of biggest, bigger leaks that have appeared just in the internet in, in, in the recent years. Sony get, gets hacked, emails are dumped on the internet. DNC emails, Democratic National Committee in the US, emails appear also on the internet. So, more and more journalists and non-journalists are having to deal with dumps of documents. It's not just corporations. Who doesn't know WikiLeaks? WikiLeaks is this organization that we, you know, it, it started at around a decade ago or so, but we all knew about it in 2010 with investigations like Cablegate, which was the inner dealings of the US diplomatic service. And today we're getting leaks all the time in journalism too, and that's why technology is very important for us because we want to receive leaks in an anonymous way, right? So there are technologies around, these two technologies out there are open source, we're all adapting them and we have our own ways to receive leaks anonymously. But I'm here to talk about this message. This is how the biggest leak in journalism history started. Hello, are you interested in data? I'm sure that if I ask this here, the answer would be very simple. What would you answer to a message like that? Yay! <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> You're there. This is the, my test to make sure that you guys are real. Um, yes, obvious, right? Well, not so obvious, because this message that my colleague at the German newspaper Süddeutsche Zeitung got was also sent to a big newspaper in the US was also sent to WikiLeaks, and the whistleblower, John Doe, didn't get a response. But of course, my colleague Bastian in Germany said, well, of course, we are very interested. And that triggered the Panama Papers, the biggest leak in journalism history. You can see here the comparison of previous leaks. Remember I just mentioned Cablegate. Those are, in the left, are other leaks that we worked in um, at the ICIJ before. This is what we had to deal with in ICIJ a year ago, almost two years ago now, when we started working on this investigation. Okay, we're in a big data <laughs> conference. I'm talking about just 2.6 terabytes of data, but <laughs> if you see the scale, for us was a big change. So things needed to change inside our organization. These files from the Panama Papers belonged to a Panamanian law firm called Mossack Fonseca with headquarters in Panama and offices in around 40 countries in the world. This is the universe that we were diving into when we started investigating. When we investigated and we published, we published our story back in April 2016. It was, you know, the biggest leak in journalism history. We made Prime Minister of Iceland resign, the Prime Minister of Pakistan, again, investigations around the world. We also won the Pulitzer Prize, which is the highest recognition in journalism, like the Oscars for journalism. But our work wasn't done. Our work keeps creating reactions around the world. The Panama Papers, which was published in April 2016, still makes waves and has impact today. In journalism, when we publish a story, it normally lasts just, you know, for a few days. Now we're having to think, how can we deal with these 2.6 terabytes so they can expose corruption for decades? And in the meantime, do our jobs. 
So in the meantime, not only we took care of the Panama Papers and investigations were being done around the country, we also dealt with a new set of leaks that we received thanks to Sue Deutsche Zeitung, uh, which is this, the Paradise Papers. We just published this investigation, another leak, even smaller, but all the knowledge that we acquired on how to deal with this information over time was applied to all these investigations and all these leaks that we've been getting to. The Paradise Papers, just to give you a brief overview, it's not one leak, it's 21 leaks. We got leaks from a law firm in Bermuda called Appleby, some geography there, Bermuda, Appleby. Then we got a law firm uh, from, or a small family firm from Singapore called Asia City, and we got data from 19 corporate registries around the world. These 19 corporate registries are places that if the world were different, we would be able to go into the websites, download the data, and search who's behind a company. The problem is they don't have websites sometimes, or they don't show who the real owners of companies are. So what happens in this world? It's a legal world that it's built so that people hide themselves behind companies and nobody knows. Thanks to all this data that we've been receiving over the years, we were able to expose who the real owner of these companies were, and sometimes when they were creating illegalities. Or we were exposing, for example, names of politicians. We got, in Panama Papers, 150 politicians connected to offshore finance. In Paradise Papers, at least 120 politicians. They were all using this parallel system in secret, because despite all the technology that the representative from the Spanish tax agency showed, he doesn't have that data. He cannot cross-check what he has, and that big technology and big data technology that he's using, he cannot cross-check it with anything, because all this is secret. We expose the names of politicians. We also expose the name of multinational companies and how they are using the system to avoid taxes. So legal, but pay less taxes than you guys and me together. And basically, at the core of all the investigations and all these leaks that we dealt with is mostly tax avoidance, which I would encourage you to look at this tweet because this is a GIF and I couldn't just like, I couldn't play it here, but it's city. Show me a visual metaphor of tax avoidance. And then the car moves in. And as the car moves in, because it's a luxury, very nice car, just goes under the barrier and doesn't pay for the parking. That is what we've been exposing with all these leaks and what, regardless of the technology, tax agencies around the world don't have because they don't have the data. We do. So I want to talk to you about, not about how we can end tax havens like this um, uh, petition, online petition that a million people have signed already, um, are asking for. I want to share with you what is the technology that we used to crack all these documents. Because I always say that we got lucky that we got these leaks now, 2015, 2016, 2017, because the technology is ready to help us. These are what I call the papers, data superheroes. I'm here talking to you today, but I'm here talking in representation of all of them. They are the data team at the International Consortium of Investigative Journalists. The technology that I'm gonna show you now and the tools that we used have been either developed or implemented by these people. The analysis have been either developed, like has been done by these people. And in these photos, and I encourage you to look at their names and follow them all on Twitter, because they are great. In these names and in this team, you'll find developers, you'll find you know, back-end engineers, you'll find a front-end engineer, you'll find an expert of natural language processing, a system administrator inside a news organization. Technology has been used in news organizations for a long time, but we have not put it so much to the service of the reporting. 
And now at the ICIJ, we have a great team that does that. Just, just as a small background on the ICIJ, the International Consortium of Investigative Journalists is a nonprofit organization with headquarters in Washington, DC. We are nonprofit, so we don't have a commercial background. We receive donations from people like you or from big foundations. And what we do is we expose corruption around the world by joining forces with journalists around the world. Right now, we are a newsroom of around 25 people, and all these people are part of the technology team, of the tech team and data team of the ICIJ. So around 40% of our staff is, are not journalists, or not people that were trained in journalism school as journalists, because I consider all of them journalists. And of course, some are journalists. I'm a journalist myself that I started to uh, learn uh, about technology and about data uh, through the years. And right now, the team is led. I used to be the leader of the team uh, I, for around three and a half years. And now, I'm on sabbatical. So the people that are leading the team are the two people at the, uh, the bottom, Pierre Romera, who's the CDO and CTO, and Emilia diaz Struck, who's the research editor. So what I'm gonna, you're going to see now is their baby. All of them are responsible for what we achieved together. We also work with external firms like Populate, which is a Spanish design studio that uh, work with us in, um, in analyzing some of the data. For us, it was very important when we got these leaks to look at the threat model. We needed to see who our enemies were. And luckily, when we analyzed these leaks that I've been talking about, like the Panama Papers and the Paradise Papers, we decided that the NSA, the National Security Agency in the US, was not our biggest enemy. And that influenced the technology choices that we did. Why did we decide they were not our enemy? Well, what we had in our hands was data from individuals or corporations and taxes. It's not like we're investigating like Edward Snowden did, how the NSA spies on us. So every time when you choose technology, you have to make a compromise. We made a compromise of not having maybe the most, 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 most secure system in order to have a lot of people accessing the data and in order to be able to work in a network around the world. So we use the cloud to work with these leaks. Um, I always joke that Amazon AWS is the 11th employee in the team because um, we, have <laughs> we have to pay a lot to Amazon uh, to um, have our data. But we are using the power of the cloud and the power of services like AWS to process this data. As you can imagine, these leaks, the Panama Papers, 2.6 terabytes, the Paradise Papers, 1.4 terabytes, it's basically, they have a lot of documents, right? And it's basically emails. These documents come from law firms. It's like coming from your companies. What, what do you have inside your computer? You have a lot of emails. You have PDFs. You have images. You have Word documents, etc. So that's what we had to deal with. So as you can imagine, one of the biggest challenges that we had was making the documents machine readable. So doing optical character recognition. In order to do that in a very fast way, what we tried to do was to parallelize the work um, through temporary machines that we set up in Amazon. And then we used open source technology to process it. We used Tesseract, which is an open source uh, optical character recognition program. And then we did some modifications on some packages of Apache Tika and created our own processing chain called Extract. Um, I guess many of you are geeks, so I would encourage you to go to the ICIJ GitHub and look at the code, tell us where you think we can improve. And then what we did was basically have a big queue, sending the documents in a parallel way, getting them processed with this technology, and once the text was extracted, sending them to Apache Solar, which is the technology that we used as, a, as an index. 
whenever we choose a technology in ICIJ, we really have to have our users in mind. And these are our users. Our users range from here, the Watergate type reporter, which is you know, a reporter that is not very tech savvy. And we have everything from here to here to the very, very, very tech savvy journalist or developer that is working in the team. In ICIJ, we work in collaborations with newsrooms around the world. So we've been working in collaboration with around 100 newsrooms in our latest projects. So as you can imagine, our users are very varied. So we cannot have very tech savvy uh, and very sophisticated tools because then our reporter, Watergate type reporter, cannot deal with this data. So we always have that in mind. We also, also always try to go with open source first for two reasons. One, because we're journalists, therefore we're poor and we don't have money. I don't have money to pay hundreds or thousands of dollars in licenses, unfortunately, unless you want to donate to ICIJ. If you go to ICIJ.org, uh, we receive donations. Uh, but um, we don't have as much money as big corporations do. And also open source allow us to adapt the tools to our needs. So that's what we do. We go into the, you know, into the market and see what open source tools are there. And we identify a need and try to meet them with uh, these tools. So for example, one of our needs is, OK, if we work with newsrooms around the world, 100 newsrooms around the world, and that ends up being around 400 reporters in our latest investigations, we need them to communicate with each other. We really need to make them feel that they're part of a team. How do we do that? Social network. You know, we have Facebook to communicate with friends and family. Let's have our own social network. So our team talks to each other around the world. These people are scattered around the world. Some people have never met in person. So we got this software called Oxwell that is open source that was originally uh, designed for your typical social networking um, um, needs like dating. Actually, the form of Oxwell, the original form, had a, a few questions that we had to take out, like, what are you looking for, male or female? As you can imagine, we, we took it out because, you know, it's not what we wanted to do. So we adapted this dating social networking platform to investigative journalism, and we got our reporters around the world to communicate leads and insights to each other on a daily basis. And then, for us, what's very important to apply this methodology of radical sharing. ICIJ had the data, all these millions of documents, but we wanted all the journalists that we work with to look at those documents, so we shared them with everybody. Around 400 journalists, as I said, in every project for Panama Papers and uh, the Paradise Papers. How? using open source technology again. Um, for example, to have a user interface to this index of you know, thousands or millions and millions of words and text that we had, we got a software called Project Blacklight that was originally built for library catalogs. And we adapted it to investigative journalism. And then we tweaked it, and now it has our, you know, our logo, and, and then we built on top of that. At a core of it, it's very simple. This is, we call it our knowledge center. That's where our journalists can search for the Paradise Papers. They can also search for some previous leaks for the corporate registries, etc. What do you need? to get journalists to do their work, a search box. <laughs> so at the top left of the, of the, of the uh, platform, there's a search box where journalists can search. And when they search a term, they get results. Same function then for a library catalog, now used for, to revolutionize investigative reporting. So what would you search for if you had access to these leaks? Trump. Right? That's one of the words that a lot of people would want to search. Is like, is Donald Trump in these leaks? He's not. But in the Paradise Papers, there are a lot of references to him. Um, you cannot see the search results because I took them out for obvious reasons. But as you can see, if you search the word Trump in the Paradise Papers, you would get, you know, around 16,000, 1,600 results. 
Normally, when we get results, there are a lot of false positives. In this case, all of them are false positives. So basically, Donald Trump is not in the lead. But that's why we still need journalists to go through the documents. What we do is people can filter, and then maybe like our journalists can also filter by file type, etc., so that they can make their research faster. In order to speed up research, our journalists could also do batch searches, so they could actually um, get a list of all the politicians in their country, upload it as a CSV, and then get a CSV back with the hits. Again, not perfect, a lot of false positives. Um, but much better than reading them one by one. This is the calculation that our colleagues in France, Premier Lynch, did for a subset of the data. If they were to look at all the files from Appleby, this law firm with headquarters in Bermuda, it would take four journalists seven and a half years of their time. So, much better. We also uh, tried to do some work to structure the information because in the leaks that we've been receiving, there's always some sort of structured data. It's not always in a database format, although in this case, in the Paradise Papers, we had a SQL Server database. And what we did is we needed to put them in a format that our reporters could use to do reporting and do research. They don't know how to do SQL queries. So we used open source technology like Talend to do transformations on that original database to select some rows, some columns, some, you know, restructure the database. Um, this allowed us, uh, this technology allowed us to work remotely in the same space. So a reporter, um, a reporter uh, forward slash developer in Costa Rica could work with a developer here in Spain. And they worked syncing everything and at the same time, despite the time differences and country differences. And then we also used graph technology to show it because reporters understand dots that are connected to each other. So we use Neo4j, which is also open sourced, and another tool called Lincurious. So reporters could, again, enter a name in a search box and then click on dots to discover who's connected to who. With that, we got all the impact that I've talked to you about. Of course, some reporters were able to do Cypher queries, which is Neo4j's querying language, and do a bit more analysis. But just with a search box and some visualization that they can click through, we exposed how hundreds of politicians were actually lying to us by using this parallel system, and in some cases, not paying taxes. So we felt a little bit, oh, you're not seeing my GIF, but this is a GIF of, uh, of like, we felt like superheroes uh, with this technology. And that's what it's basically boosting and powering our, our reporting. Some colleagues, like these colleagues from Sweden, actually went one step farther. They got this, this data that we restructured and that we shared with all these journalists and then cross-matched it with the database of taxpayers in Sweden, which is public, unlike in other countries, like in Spain. So they were able to find stats of who are the Swedes in the Paradise Papers, how a lot of them were men, how they were older, how many of them earned a lot of money, which is kind of like obvious, but they were able to do statistics and analysis based on cross-checking to other sources too. And then the most important part is that we didn't want to keep the investigative power to ourselves. We also used technology and this work that we did reconstructing the databases and converting it into a graph database to make you the investigators, to make the public the investigators. This is the offshore leaks database, the database where we dump the names of the people in the leaks, not all the documents, because we cannot do that for security reasons, but where we dump the names of the people uh, in the leaks and the companies. So we basically expose the secrecy that these people had, were looking for when they went to all these jurisdictions. And I have good news for you. I really encourage you to save that URL because tomorrow we're going to be uploading the data from the Paradise Papers, not all of it, but 25,000 new entities connected to Appleby, this law firm from Bermuda. So I would encourage you to go there because not only you can search and you know 
explore through graphs. You can also download the data in CSV or Neo4j and connect it to all the databases that you have. Hopefully, the guy from the Spanish tax agency does that tomorrow, too. Um, but honestly, as I said at the beginning, whenever I come to conferences like this, I listen to your talks, I feel like I'm in the Pleistocene. I don't know if that's the word in English, but like I feel like this very woman from the cavern that is using very old technology. But if with very old technology, we are finding all this information and getting all this exposure in the public, maybe with the help of people like you, we can actually do much more to impact society and make the world a better place. Because what I just showed, it's basically a tip of the iceberg. I know we've missed many stories in Panama Papers. I know we've missed many stories in the Paradise Papers. I know in 10 years from now, somebody will become famous and we'll have a connection in the Paradise Papers and the Panama Papers. And unless we do something to preserve these documents and make them searchable with the latest techniques, we're going to miss many connections and we're not going to be able to expose corruption. So our to-do list is very, very long. All these that you see here, we didn't do. Hopefully, with the help, again, of people like you or companies that we partner with, like Neo4j and Talent, or with the help of people that donate. Again, I, I don't know if I've said this enough. We receive donations at icij.org. Hopefully, we'll be able to do things much more advanced things to expose these data and to expose the people that are corrupt. Because how I feel, and I don't want to end in a sad note, is I really feel like we've been playing bingo so far with the work that we've been doing in journalism. And I really want to stop playing bingo. I really want us to eliminate serendipity. So if you have any ideas, if you want to work with us, we're looking for a Java engineer, by the way. If you have want to donate us money, or if you have a hard drive with a leak that you want to give us, please come and see me. This is my contact. Thank you very much. <laughs>